Hello everyone. Uh, today we have with us uh, Dr. Arun Pandey, who is a, a surgery resident, and we are here for a, our meditation sessions. And the topic what we decided was interesting obstruction. So yeah, giving over to you, sir. Hi, Rohan. Uh, as decided, uh, today we'll discuss about intestinal obstruction. So basically, for a surgeon, it is one of the very important topic. And uh, so a patient when comes with intestinal obstruction, the most common complaint which anybody presents with is pain abdomen. So the patient mainly complains of pain abdomen and there are other few things which we have to look after and extract from the patient. Like not passing of stools, like abdominal distension. These are the things which we have to look after. But mostly the patient comes with pain abdomen and vomiting. Now again, it depends upon, so in some kinds of obstruction, vomiting may not be the feature presenting feature, like in case of distal obstruction and not. So typically intestinal obstruction presents with colicky abdominal pain, distension of the abdomen, vomiting, and obstipation. Obstipation, obstipation means not passing of stools and flatus, both. So it is termed as obstipation. So again, it depends whether the obstruction is higher up or it is lower in the large bowel. Like in case of jejunal obst obstruction, patient will complain of pain, but there will be almost no distension. So more the obstruction is distally present, we'll have more features of distension, but vomiting will be an early feature in case of jejunal obstruction. So higher the obstruction, more prominent the vomiting, lower the obstruction, more prominent the constipation. Okay. Patients with large bowel obstruction at their early stage, they do not present with vomiting. They first present with not passing of stools, pain abdomen, all these things. And maximum distension will be there in case of ileal obstructions. Because something in between stuck. Yes. The above, above thing will come out with vomiting. The down thing will come out with uh, your constipation. Yes. But the middle thing which is stuck is... So distension, central distension maximum you can see in case of ileal uh, obstruction. Now coming to uh, when the patient comes, how will you go with the uh, management? So you have to look for uh, features first the vitals. Okay. So because in case of obstruction, what happens is that there is a third space loss of fluid. The obstructed segment will collect water in within it due to various mechanisms. Like there is twisting, there is decreased uh, absorption of uh, fluid from the bowel. So there will be collection. Yeah. There will be increased secretion from the uh, to, into the lumen. The so that will lead to, and that collected part of the content of the bowel again gets infected with the, uh, the normal colonic bacteria. There will be overgrowth of the bacteria. So there will be uh, distension features will be there. Coming to next, after you see the vitals, if the patient's vitals, first is resuscitation. So when the patient comes, mostly the patient presents late. So you have to normalize his BP by giving him adequate fluids. So normally our small bowel secretes around 9 to 12 liters of fluid in a day. So if the patient presents to you after 24 hours, you have to adequately resuscitate. So that the hypotension, because if you take the patient for OT immediately, the patient might collapse. So first is vitals, you have to take it to normal. Second, electrolyte balance. So electrolyte, before giving anesthesia, uh, it is very important that the sodium potassium, these things will be normal. What happens is that in intestinal obstruction, initially the patient will have slightly acidosis due to dehydration because there is third space loss of the fluid. So that dehydration will lead to mild acidosis. But later on when the patient starts vomiting, there is loss of chloride ions and potassium, which leads to alkalosis, mild alkalosis. So overall, there is no pH imbalance as we see. We encounter so many patients. We look for sodium, potassium, all those. But the pH more or less, the body compensates itself. And... Uh, after seeing that, we can go for investigations, like routine investigations. 
uh, we must in all cases of obstruction we must uh, apart from routine investigation we must look for amylase and lipase as many a times it is asso associated with pancreatitis so amylase lipase serum electrolytes are very important apart from the routine investigations in x ray we can see multiple air fluid levels so normally there are three air fluid levels present in our body as you know in the fundic gas shadow in the duodenum and the cecum but if there is more than 3 or more than 5 air fluid levels we can call it as label it as obstruction and more distal the obstruction more number of air fluid levels will be present and more proximal the lesser will be present again in the x ray by seeing the x ray also we we try to find out that where is the obstruction so we have to look if it is the obstruction is mainly central so the more the air fluid levels will be centrally located and you have to see whether where is the bowel dilated plus you have you have to also see the character of the bowel like if there are ostracians large dilated ostracians we are seeing in the x ray mostly it is large bowel if you are seeing uh, the herring bone pattern then it is uh, valvular conventus mostly for uh, your jejunum ileum is characterless okay so this is how you look for x ray if you can afford to then you must go for ct scan also so what extra ct scan will give us is that apart from we know that in x ray there multiple air fluid levels are there so confirm it is obstruction case of obstruction but in ct what extra we can know is that we can know the character and the uh, uh, the bowel wall the character of the bowel wall so we can know whether there is air in the bowel wall this so more detailed you can find out and is it, uh, is it required in the is it required in the emergency cases like if the patient is there they are trying to go for a ct it's an emergency naked option mm, ct can be done within a few minutes only so if possible we should get it done it is unlike mri it does not take that much time so you should get it done and uh, uh but again if the patient presents with uh, its complication of uh, obstruction then uh, anyhow you have to go for laparotomy you can directly take the patient to uh, ot so again uh, the the causes of obstruction can be many things like outside the bowel it there can be adhesions there can be and the most common cause for obstruction in a patient is adhesions and adhesions comes from previous surgeries only so that this is very must that whenever a patient comes to you with intestinal obstruction you should look for scars over the entire abdominal wall look for scars of previous surgeries ask the patient in history see the abdomen and mostly pelvic surgeries this hysterectomy cesarean sections uh, these lead to more of adhesions any surgery can lead so adhesions these days are the most 60 to 70% cause for intestinal obstruction and there can be many other causes also like tuberculosis like uh, typhoid in infection causes there can be some tumor some gist which can act as a uh, like obstruction site there can be some internal herniation so there are many causes for intestinal obstruction so initially we start with conservative treatment if the patient is not toxic if there are no signs of strangulation so initially we start with conservative treatment so first thing you have to give give rest to the bowel so we keep the patient nbm that is the first thing to do second thing you have to decompress the bowel so you have to put nasogastric tube or rice tube after putting the rice tube we put it on continuous suction and fourth hourly or second hourly depending upon the situation so our motto is to basically decompress the bowel so that it gets rest because what happens initially in a case of intestinal obstruction if you auscultate the abdomen the the bowel tries physiologically to relieve the obstruction so there will be hyperperistaltic movements very high pitch sounds borbor gimme you can hear on the uh, stretch later on it it fatigues it gets tired of and then goes into the silent abdomen yeah. as we say so uh, we the first thing to do is to decompress the abdomen to decompress the bowel sorry 
so we need uh, we need to put the rise to second thing how will you know that the distension is coming down or it is increasing so you should must measure measure the abdominal girth and you should keep a chart so second only we should see that the girth is coming down if it is coming down if the vomiting features is getting relieved the patient is not any more complaining of uh, vomiting then these are the signs you can know and you can uh, again look for signs of uh, recoming back of the bowel sounds initially it will come sluggish or the most important you can ask the patient whether you pass flatus or not so in case of conservative if you see the patient is coming down to normal then you have to monitor the patient correct his electrolyte and the most important thing to correct is potassium if potassium is low yeah. is one of the most important cause of paralytic ileus so if you are seeing that the patient is improving you can go on with the conservative treatment for 24 to 48 hours but if the patient is not improving the distension is not coming down the vomiting is has not stopping the patient is not showing any signs of improvement then we decide to take for laparotomy once you do laparotomy any problem you can solve it intraoperatively so we have some questions with us and the first question yeah, what sure. i have is when do we find silent abdomen in case of intestinal obstruction yeah that is what so initially in case of mechanical intestinal obstruction intestinal obstruction can be mechanical dynamic or can be a dynamic so in case of mechanical intestinal obstruction initially the sounds will be like high high pitch sounds bor bor gimmick with sometimes tinkling sounds of the large bowel tinkling sounds metallic sounds so once the intestine gets fatigue then it goes into the phase of silence so this is one kind of silence silence of abdomen other thing is in case of a dynamic obstruction like in case of acute pancreatitis in case of any systemic inflammation in case of any metabolic derangement in any patient the intestine will automatically go into the phase of paralytic ileus in case of electrolyte imbalance like mainly hypokalemia so these two phases both are silent abdomen but the mechanism is different so we need to address the root cause in both of them okay sir and the next we have is suppose there is a patient who has a strangulating obstruction so what is the initial line of management in that case uh, that is what in case of stra strangulated intestinal obstruction patient will not uh, look normal to you in, yeah. in like apart from the features of uh, vomiting distension obstipation the patient will look toxic very toxic very dehydrated he will have features of uh, inflammation like fever there will the the mass which is palpable will be tense tender will be excruciatingly painful actually in normal intestinal obstruction there will be crescendo or decrescendo type of pain so we'll, we have a phase of remittance in between but in case of strangulation the patient will have excruciating pain and that will be continuous the, the mass will be tense tender inflamed uh, with fever and toxic you know, toxicosis and the that phase only if you look it will it will be very it will look toxic to you so in those cases i don't think you should go for a conservative management because 100% there is some uh, obstruction strangulation you need to open and look look to it okay sir so next so what we have is let's suppose there is a patient who has a partial small bowel obstruction so will you do a surgery and if you don't do then why and if you do then why why will you do partial as in you mean subacute intestinal obstruction yes subacute so in case of subacute intestinal obstruction what happens is that there is no obstipation like the there may be the patient is having features of vomiting but it is getting relieved in between having constipation but there is no complete pass maybe is passing flatus but not able to pass stools or if he is kept nbm so he is able to again come back to normal and so there might be many reasons like mild stricture in the bowel which is uh, so which it is causing obstruction when he is taking some low fiber diet like lots of uh, non vegetarian diet all together so in those cases you should initially go for uh, conservative management only but if the patient and the most mostly the patient will come out of it but if the patient is uh, 
coming again and again and if there is any sort of mechanical obstruction like stricture then you have to go for laparotomy and you have to uh, do stricturoplasty for strictures and those things but uh, subacute many a times is related to other features like acute pancreatitis and all that so in those cases you need not do anything it will come back to normal okay so next we have uh, the questions when do you close a uh, loop ileus tommy in case of a ileus following a partial ileal reception for a benign condition uh, mostly depends where is the tumor first of all the benign tumor and uh, secondly it also depends if it is related to some complication like if there is associated perforation if the bowel and if the peritoneum is contaminated the patient is toxic there are chances of anastomotic leak if we do primary closure then only we go for uh, stoma otherwise uh, we can do primary closure and put drains and come and uh, if you put stoma then you should ideally wait for 6 to 12 weeks the patient should uh, uh, start, uh, should become nutritionally better he should just uh, tolerate everything the, all these sepsis and everything the wound should be completely healed he should be nutritionally all right and the electrolyte everything is normal then around 6 to 12 weeks later you can plan for recanalization of the stoma but mostly it is not required in case of the nine cases okay so next what we have is uh, so what is the maximum duration between the acute intestinal obstruction and the surgery what we will do that is the laparotomy so the maximum duration and keep uh, maximum yeah and that is what i told like initially if there are no features of toxemia strangulation then you can go for conservative treatment and wait for 24 to 48 hours if the patient is becoming better then you can wait and watch if the patient is not becoming better then you should not wait more than 48 to 72 hours maximum you should because if the bowel is undergoing gangrene if you waste time then more a part of the bowel will be involved and progressively then you will land up excising more more part of the bowel and the patient will land into short bowel syndrome if more than 100 cm uh, is has to be resected sir uh, can you provide a short note on the electrolyte imbalance in case of intestinal obstruction mostly initially patient when uh, starts to have intestinal obstruction there will be the first thing which will happen is dehydration because patient is not taking orally he is vomiting there is third space loss this dehydration and loss of chloride ions in the vomiting will lead to initial acidosis which will be mild of nature and later on due to loss of potassium and chloride again there will be mild alkalosis so there is no much difference in the ph but yeah overall we can say that there will be hyponatremia hypokalemia some sort of hypocalcemia in few cases uh, other than that yeah, everything yeah. will be normal yeah answer so the last question what we have is just uh, even idea about the management as well as the treatment findings in case of uh, intestinal obstruction which will lead to intestinal obstruction okay uh, intussusception is actually more common in uh, young children which are like 6 to 18 months so intussusception is nothing but telescoping of the uh, proximal segment into the distal yeah. so we classify it as intussusceptions and the different parts are there so basically in children of 6 to 18 months uh, they often suffer from recurrent gastrointestinal infection and that infection undergoes some sort of fibrosis and some sort and that is what where like the uh, it starts intussusception and in old ages also it happens in adults but in those cases there can be other reasons like there can be a mass in the bowel and other things so in uh, basically the features will be same as intestinal obstruction only on palpation you can feel a sausage shaped mass in and around the umbilicus having its concavity towards the umbilicus and that mass will be very much mobile and you can uh, compress it and uh, it will not move with respiration 
that one will be there and you can see various signs are there like target sign those signs we can you we can see in a ct scan and even x-ray also sometimes we can see rather than that other management is same only same only. and uh, on pr findings we get a very significant red current jelly that is one of the important thing so yes we come to the end of this session and thank you so much for joining thank you thank you so much rohan